Yeah, firstly, I'd just like to start by saying thanks for everyone for coming. Um, of course, thanks to Michaels and uh, Julie from Nikon for um, asking me to come and present to you today. Uh, i just start by checking. Can everyone hear me up the back? Is that volume all right? Everyone's okay? Great. Thanks. Um, I was going to introduce myself, but it's been handled, so uh, I'll skip to the next slide. But, um, just to give you uh, a bit of a history about myself, I um, studied photography at the Melbourne School of Art and Photography, which uh, is no longer around, but it's a similar college to PSC. Uh, my final year was spent specialising in sports photography. Uh, from there, I worked at the Melbourne Football Club as their club photographer, and I got into freelance photography work for sporting magazines, so shooting a lot of triathlon, motocross, extreme sports, that sort of area. Um, Getty Images was always the dream job I wanted to have, but uh, it took, to be honest with you, years of persistence to break into it. And I, I think probably that is because it is such a great job. Um, not many people leave, so you have to sort of bide your time a bit. But uh, over that time, I sort of never gave up on the dream. And I worked uh, various jobs from working in photo labs, um, shooting real estate, shooting weddings, I was even digging holes for a while, landscaping, all those sort of things, just to keep money coming in and uh, keep that dream going. Uh, in, yeah, in 2004, I got my first freelance shift with Getty Images, and I was lucky enough in 2006 they offered me a, a full-time position. Um, a lot of the work when I first started with Getty, I might get the occasional football game, but a lot of the work was at sort of major events, so the Australian Open Tennis or the uh, F1, um, uh, World Superbikes, the, um, try and think what else, Spring Racing Carnival, and a lot of it was shooting corporate events, so I might be shooting signage, the corporate marquees, all these sort of things. It wasn't exactly sport, but um, I guess I, I tried to use that. I was in the venues and I, I tried to watch what the other photographers were doing. Uh, definitely, I guess, yeah, seeing great photographers, um, seeing how they used light, wh where they went in certain times of the day, it definitely um, really helped me when I got to the, the point where I was shooting sports photography. I knew where I wanted to go for, for certain events. Um, today, I guess I'm going to just sort of run through some of my, my favourite shots um, and discuss what I look for when I'm shooting a sports, sports event. Um, you'll probably hear me say a lot of the same things, but I, I think preparation is really key. A lot of planning goes into shots, they don't just happen. Um, I like to try and use light, and um, I think back, backgrounds are a really major, important thing to look out for. And along with that also being, being creative. Um, again, just, just to go and say for this slide, um, probably the two or three years before, I'd been doing all the corporate marquees at the, at the motorbikes down at Phillip Island, so I knew when I finally got to shoot, shoot the action, I sort of knew where I wanted to be for the start of the race, which were the, the main corners where the incidents happened. So it, it definitely, uh, although I didn't like that work so much at the time, it definitely was an advantage once I, I got to have that opportunity to shoot sport. Uh, I thought I'd just, just start with, this is basically my office. So I thought I'd show you that, not because I like taking photos of myself, but um, just to give you an idea of probably the, the second most important piece of equipment I have these days is my computer. Um, that is the digital world these days. Everyone wants photos instantly. So uh, quite often now, the first shot out is the one that gets used. So it's quite critical I get those pictures up on the site as soon as I can. Um, that, I guess, creates a problem in that probably any event I'm shooting, I probably spend half the game with my head in the computer and not watching what I should be in the action. So I think that's probably one of the real arts these days is to know when you can take your eye off the action and try and get some pictures out. I, wherever possible, if it's broadcast on the radio, I'll have a radio on, and then that at least tells me where the action is when I've got my head in the computer. Uh, so for example, I'll just go over, when I get to a venue, 
for if it's football, whatever it is, I'm usually there two hours before the event starts. And the first thing I'm doing is going out and looking at where all the photo positions are. And I'm trying to predict where the action's going to take place. So some sports it's obvious, others it's not. AFL football, it can happen anywhere. But as a general rule for AFL, I'm sitting around the 50 metre line. That way I can get all the uh, jubo and excitement if they celebrate, hopefully some big marks by the forwards. Um, I'm also looking where's the best background. I, I'm trying to get the clearest background I can if possible, so I'm trying to use the light. I don't really want the, the light beaming on the crowd. I want uh, you know, non-distracting backgrounds. And I'm also, if it works out, I'm also looking at trying to stay near the bench side. So I'm covering all my news, news angles. I've got, I can get the coach's address, any injuries that come off. Um, yeah, working for a picture agency, we're supplying images to so many different sources. So you've got to be on top of what the news angles are and try and cover all those bases. Uh, this is just a small take from last year's AFL Grand Final. Um, just out of interest, for a, a normal AFL game, I'll probably shoot between two and 3,000 frames a game. Uh, for this Grand Final, I think I was around 7,000 frames. Uh, that's partly because for the, for the finals, we unfortunately only get one AFL pass, so I'm covering the whole event by myself. So that means crowds arriving, pre-match, all the action, the celebrations after the game, in the rooms, um, and then even the, uh, the team being presented on stage that night. So for me, I, was, I think I was at the ground about 9 o'clock and I probably filed my last photo uh, about midnight, so it was about a 15-hour shift. Uh, this probably ended up being one of my favourite frames from, from the night, uh, from the day. And it, Initially it was, it was the, uh, the team being presented on stage that night and it was something I was a bit reluctant to cover just because I knew I'd be so busy filing pictures from, from the game. As, a, as I said, we only had the one pass. We decided it was an important thing to cover so I went and did it. Um, and I guess it just shows you that a picture can come from anywhere so you shouldn't turn your nose up at any opportunity you get. Uh, again, I'll, I'll talk about backgrounds a lot, but this is an action shot I really like, except for one, one little element, and I'm not sure if your eye does, but my eye goes directly to this security guard in the corner here. I don't know if it's, it's the, the angle of the foot pointing down, but um, for me, a great, a great photograph has no distractions. Um, and so that one little element just stopped that from being a really good, good photograph. But I, I'm, I mean, it gets harder and harder these days with security guards in, in fluoro vests and things, but I'm trying to look for a really clean background. So the only thing you're concentrating on is, is the action. Uh, this is one of my favourite pictures from uh, uh, World Swimming Champs a couple of years ago, and I probably put this down to working for two main reasons. Um, one, I noticed there was a really black corner in the venue where the light really dropped off. And so that was my opportunity to use that as a background. But also, I was lucky enough to able to watch um, rehearsals. So I was able to put in the, the preparation and watch the routine. This was um, Team Russia. And I knew they did this really dramatic start where they all went underwater and they pushed this one girl out of the water and she did a flip. I, I knew that was the key moment. And that was the, the moment I wanted to capture. So then it was about trying to isolate that bit of action with that background I'd seen. So I was positioning myself to get, I'd sort of marked a spot in the pool where I knew they were going to do it, and then positioning that black corner behind. So to the left of this is signage, to the right is crowd. Um, I had a little bit of signage uh, on the pool edge as well, so I ended up laying, basically laying on my tummy with a 400, I guess like a, like a sniper almost, completely laying flat. Uh, I couldn't really see what was happening under the, in the pool once they went under, so I was sort of shooting blind, if you like, and waiting just, waiting for the first sign of her to pop out of the water, and I was trying to pick her up with my autofocus. Um, yeah, this was shot on a, a 400. I've shot this at two thousandth of a second to really freeze the action. Um, and I'm at 3.2 is my aperture. Uh, 
yeah, I, I, again, if, this, if I was a bit to the right and I caught this in front of the crowd, I really would have lost all these water droplets and things. So I just sort of, sort of want to illustrate the importance of trying to get a nice background to work with. Okay, I just thought I'd give you a, a bit of a, this is a, hopefully this loads for us. Uh, just wanted to show you a 360. So, this is a 360 from the Australian Open this year. So, we're in the photo positions here. Um, we've got the coaches' boxes behind us. And just to show you what we're working with, so, this year they put in all these great neon signs which really glowed in the background. So we've got ball kids, you know, linesmen, a clock here to work with. So I'm always looking for the cleanest, cleanest background. So it's the same thing at the other end. Lots of signs. Um, so this year I was really trying to work these, these little black corners here. So there's a nice little couple of little black spots just there. So I'll just... Back out of that, just one sec. Sorry, John, I might need you to. to yeah, yeah. I've yeah. just lost my. So you want to get back to the channel? Airport. There we go. Is it this one here? Uh, sorry, this one here. Okay. Sorry. Excuse me, guys, I've just recently changed over to a Mac, so I'm still finding my way around. So anyway, I was uh, using that little black corner I was illustrating, um, and especially on the backhand return of serve, uh, we could isolate the action with this nice clean black background, no distractions in the way. And so that's where I was trying to get my stock. So just to show you the difference with uh, some signage in the background, obviously uh, I'm still concentrating, so I'm always got the subject matter in focus when they're around the court and I'm trying to pick spots where there's no distractions in the background. Obviously I can't control where they do things. Sometimes there's signage and things and so I've got to be ready to fire away when something happens. But uh, ideally I'm trying to get that little sweet spot of the black backgrounds to, to really get a nice picture. Uh, and the same thing on the other side of the court. Um, again, another little black spot so I'm getting the backhand side. So if we're shooting the Australian Open, um, I'm trying to get five shots of every, every tennis player. So whether that's two forehands, two backhands, a serve, or a couple of forehands, them celebrating in a backhand, we want to give full coverage. Um, also going back to what I was saying before about getting the first pitcher out. So in the first game of every match, I'm trying to get something out. No matter what it is, I've got to get something out just to have something for the sights. As soon as the game starts, someone wants a picture to go along with that story. So ideally, I'm trying to get something as clean as I can, but often it may be just the fact that I'll have a little bit of signage in there. And also with tennis or football, I'm also always trying to have the ball in the shot. Um, so when I am in the first, first set, we're, we're see, uh, sending uh, with a wireless transmitter on our camera, so for the Nikon is the WR6, or WT6 I should say. Um, obviously we can't have laptops and things with us on the court, so I'm sending uh, the photo back to an editor who's waiting downstairs and they'll put the picture up on the side as quick as they can. Yeah, just back in the old days we'd, we'd probably wait till the first change of ends and we'd have a card runner come in and uh, take the cards back, but if we can get something out within the first couple of minutes, uh, we're one step ahead. So again, I'm, uh, once I've got a bit of stock, I can play around with some other shots. So um, this one, uh, Nadal's a pro prolific sweater. So this time I went to a, a 600 mil lens. Again, I'm trying to isolate him on this black background I've got. And I'm shooting at uh, two thousandth of a second to really freeze that uh, sweat drip off his nose. 
Um, I should also mention that I always work in manual exposures. I would encourage everyone to work with manual exposures, get to know your camera, um, and have full control of things. So yeah, two thousandths of a second, I'm at f4, really trying to isolate things. Uh, again, I should say, like looking at this, if I was shooting into that neon sign, the white, white uh, signage behind would really, I'd lose that sweat drop as it's just isolated against that plain black background. And again, the other reason why we're sitting in that position is we've got the uh, coaches' boxes behind us. Uh, by nature, most athletes will turn to their support crew, so it's a good thing to always think about. Uh, if I'm covering a swimming event, one of the first things I'm looking for is where is their family sitting, where is their team sitting, and I want to be positioned there for the finish of the race because I'll generally, generally look that way to celebrate. Same thing with uh, cricket, for instance. If someone's getting close to a century, I'll go and try and position myself in front of where their team's sitting because I'll generally, as a rule, celebrate in that direction. Uh, yeah, just wanted to touch on a lot of research goes into every, every shot. Um, we're not just turning up and shooting blind. So, for instance, this was a triathlon race I did in Thailand. I was there two hours before the race started, and the first thing I did was I went for a hike along the racetrack a few kilometres and tried to pick out a few, um, few spots I wanted to shoot from. Uh, Often you don't have the time to do it once the event starts. So just to touch on, for example, the Olympics, we're always there about 10 days before it starts and those whole uh, 10 days are just going to every venue and trying to work out where we want to shoot from. Um, for example, the road track, uh, the road course, we'll, we will actually drive the whole course and try and pick out the best spots that will make a picture. Same thing with the triathlon. So, for example, this triathlon I did, I picked out two or three spots. Uh, I worked out exactly what lens I needed to have with me. Um, again, I'm, I might travel a few kilometres. I don't want to be carrying excess gear if I don't need it. Uh, yeah, so I was finding this great puddle. I could get this nice reflection. Um, it sort of gave me a feel of Thailand. But again, I'd also picked out another spot because it, it may have been the chance I came back here and there was you know, some crowd standing there or something that may have ruined the shot. So I've picked out two or three, three spots I know I can, can use once the event starts. Uh, I just want to touch on, obviously we do a bit of um, sports portraiture as well as part of the job. I, I guess, try and make these as, as graphic and as different as I can think of. So, uh, for example, this one, I was trying to think of an idea to make the table tennis a bit more exciting and things and uh, I ended up buying this great big mirror from Bunnings and a, a bit of gaffer tape to keep the ball on the bat and just to get this, uh, this bold image. Um, often when we're doing portraits we may only get the athlete for you know a couple of minutes so you really need to know exactly what you're going to do. I've, I will have practiced this a few times I know exactly how it's going to look and often I'll even have a print even if it's me doing a portrait of myself but just to show them what the end product's going to be. Um, I might be meeting them for the first time. I want to get their buy-in buy to show them what the end product, and hopefully once they see an idea of how it's going to look, they'll be a bit more into the, the photo as well. So um, same thing with this shot. I had this idea. I wanted to um, have this feel of looking up through the ice. With, uh, this is Daniel Gregg before he computed, uh, competed at the last Winter Olympics. So I went through a whole process of how this is going to happen and it was probably over a month worth of work before the actual shoot. Um, you know, I was trying to think how could I do this with glass, with these, these sharp blades and things and then I, I sort of worked towards a, a thick piece of plastic and then I had to build a frame to, to get underneath and then I had to work out the reflections that were coming through. So there was a whole heap of work before this took place. So again, I done some test shots with myself or my partner or whoever I could get to make sure it worked. Um, and again, I, I'm taking this couple of examples along because I've, I've met this guy for the first time and I've got this box with a weird piece of plastic and some light. So I wanted to sort of show him what the end product was going to look like. Um, 
and to get him involved to go along with it. Uh, this is another portrait I, portraiture I did underwater, which was probably the most challenging one I've ever had. Um, yeah, it, it, it took... I, I usually use uh, Aquatech underwater housing. I like doing a lot of uh, water stuff, but for this one I needed to... I had a, a, an off-camera flash, which I'd put underwater, so I'd, I'd use Pocket Wizard. So I had a Pocket Wizard, and I ended up using uh, one of those plastic bag, waterproof plastic bags because um, it had room for a flash so I put my pocket wizard in top and then I had another flash under the water with a transmitter and that was just in a simple little waterproof map bag um, and I was sending a signal to the flash but because of the denseness of water uh, the signal won't go through so I had to sort of position myself so I was underneath the water but just the the top trigger of the remote was out of the water to send us uh, to send a signal to the flash to get it to fire. So it was uh, countless, countless times of popping out of the water and trying to synchronise ourselves and get the timing right to get this to happen. But I was really happy with the uh, end product and um, yeah, pretty dramatic image. Uh, this is an, another example. It's actually the same, same girl I shot the year later. And uh, I guess I wanted to touch on originality we all get inspired by seeing other people's work and I think it's important that A, you do get inspired but you don't just go out and copy it exactly the way it is. Um, you try and put your own, own twist on it. So I think we've probably all seen in different magazines where they look at say macro photography and they show uh, a flower in a, in a water droplet. So I saw that and thought well why can't I do that as a, as a portrait. So again I put a lot of practice into it. Um, same thing, another, I had to show the examples and I, I also had to have the athletes trust because I was basically getting her to lay under a, a thin piece of glass with a camera above and the last thing I want to do is injure one of our athletes before they go to Olympics or something like that so I have to make sure everything works and uh, there's going to be no malfunctions. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I wanted to touch on a bit about using light. Um, Triathlon is probably one of my favourite things to shoot, probably because of the time of the day it happens. I love, you know, that great early morning light. Um, I guess to sum this up, this, this was sort of three elements came together here. I, I noticed this was uh, up in Queensland. Uh, it was a very hot day and I came across this, this water station and I noticed because of the heat, some of the athletes were throwing water over themselves. So I thought that could make a shot. But there was also this little sphere of um, light coming through the trees, so just one little patch. Uh, most, the rest of the course was pretty much in darkness, so there were some nice big dark gray, green trees in the background with no light on them, so I knew there was about six stops of light difference between that little, little bright bit of sunshine I had and the, and the trees in the background. So I knew I could get that to, to drop to black. So then it was about trying to um, position myself again. I'm down really low and I'm trying to get the athlete in this little bit of light to isolate them against the black. Um, look, I was probably there for 20 minutes and I think this was the only athlete that did what I wanted them to do in that little patch of light, but that's, that's all I needed, one shot. Um, I thought I was pretty lucky to get that one, so it all came together. Again, I'm, I'm shooting in manual, so I'm, I'm exposing for that one bit of light, so if they do that, do this, you know, four steps behind, they're in darkness, it doesn't work for me, but I'm just, um, yeah, hoping they do that in that little bit of light. Again, another triathlon shot, again, nice early morning light and dramatic shadows. Um, this was shot from an overpass. Uh, I guess, again, I'm, I'm trying to work with nice clean background, so I, what you don't see outside of this, the frame is there's line markings and witches hats and arrows and, and things like that that again I had to be sort of patient and wait for the riders to go in the right area but um, I'd sort of framed it up in my camera the spot where I was hoping the, the riders would go into. Uh, this is afternoon light at the tennis um, last year so this is Kai Nishikori serving um, and I'm up in the catwalk here what I, uh, I guess I was watching this shadow come across the court 
And I noticed on his, on his second serve, when he did a kick serve, that the ball was actually coming near his, the, the, the shadow of his racket. So I thought, let's, let's try and position something with the ball around there. So I've gone, um, I've put a converter on my 400 and tried to crop in nice and tight on the shadow. Um, I think this was the, the second serve I'd, I'd tried to do this. And when I looked at the back of the camera, to be honest with you, I couldn't believe where the ball had ended up. So um, it's great when a plan comes together, but I, I couldn't have dreamed of it to be right there. But I knew I could stop straight away, that I wasn't going to get any better than that. Um, and I was very pleased to uh, see that, that image on the back of the camera. Again, just another example of using light. This time I'm, again, exposing for the, the sky. Um, I had just had this really nice cloud formation come around. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm again exposing for the cloud and I, I sort of saw this blue patch in the middle. I thought that's where I want to isolate the, uh, the action. So again, it was about moving around and trying to you know, silhouette the, uh, the action in that little spot. So uh, sometimes I guess you've got to make your own light. So this was a, an indoor track cycling event. Um, I decided to put a flash mounted on the inside of the track um, and I had a pocket wizard to fire it off. And so then I went to the outside of the track and I was trying to, trying to line it up. Um, I think it was a 4,000 individual pursuit. So I knew they'd do several laps so I'd have a good opportunity. Um, but again, it's all about getting that, that line right. Um, yeah, I, I, I've put my flash onto, sorry, I've set my camera to F22 to get the flash to give that, that star effect. And uh, obviously the steepness of the, the tracks given that, uh, given that great shadow. But uh, yeah, it was all thanks to a pocket wizard. Um, these days you could use the WR10. I don't know if anyone's seen them, but they're a little device you can just mount to your camera. And that gives you full control off a, on a, onto a flash, um, which makes it a lot easier than a pocket wizard. Uh, this is an example from the Olympics. Uh, I just wanted to, I guess, touch on being creative and, and when's the best time to do it. Um, and Olympics for us is a lot about shooting stock. So if I'm at the athletics during the uh, heats, uh, we may have four of us there and I might be looking after lanes six, seven and eight. And of those 40 heats, 38 of those heats, I might have to get lane seven or lane eight just because we're covering uh, work for the Australian Olympic Committee, uh, the US, Japan, England, we've got to get a shot of every single athlete. So a lot of what we do is shooting stock. We must get a shot of them and preferably in the heats. So anyway, I'm doing that for, I said, 38 um, heats of the 40. The two, the two heats I don't have a request is my opportunity to try something creative. So it was about trying to do a um, yeah, just do a pan. Um, I think this is at a fifteenth of a second. Again, trying to find a nice background where I had a bit of colour to work with. Um, it works for me because I've got the, the sharpness in her face, but great movement in the legs. Again, I, I think for a slow shutter speed, you, you want to really try and get, um, see something in the face. You still want that eye contact with the, uh, the athlete. Uh, swimming's another great passion of mine. I love swimming, but the, the thing I like most is underwater photography. Uh, to me, it's like a, a different world under the water. There's um, so many reflections and, and magnifications and things to work with. Um, and it also probably makes me concentrate more on what's happening above the water. Uh, I'm sort of always looking at where they rise out of the water and, and their techniques and sort of wondering how that'll work under the water. So just to give you an example of how this is all done, uh, in between the heats, obviously I've got a yeah, Aquatech underwater housing. Um, in between the heats, I put on my scuba gear and, and get in the water basically, and it's about you know, trying to work out all these angles for, and my main sweet spot is usually where they, when they dive in the water and where they're gonna rise, out, rise to start their stroke. But, um, yeah, I have this mounted on the floor. I have some weights on it to make sure it's not going to move. And then I have a cable running all the way outside of the um, pool. 
and I can either have it with a little trigger or I like to have it uh, plugged into a pocket wizard um, and then that way I can still be work, work my way all the way around the pool and I'm still shooting what's happening above the, above the water and then I'm firing the pocket wizard to shoot the underwater stuff. Um, yeah, just to touch on some, some creative stuff at the, at the tennis. Um, again, you want to pick the right time to do things. So um, if it's five all or in a tiebreaker of the set, it's not the time to be playing around with things. You want to be concentrating, trying to get the reaction when, the, when they win the set. So I often find the best time to, if you are going to have a little play, is say the beginning of the second set or something like that, the first game. Usually there's not too much drama going on. It gives you a bit of uh, time to have a quick play. Um, yeah, this is just... Uh, you know, working with a slow shutter speed. Uh, I'll grab my camera. And so I'm, I think this is, this is a quarter of a second and I'm basically getting the, the start and the finish of his action. And I'm just pulling my camera side to side. So hopefully I'm catching the start of his action and then over to the other side I'm catching the, the, the end of his action. Um, yeah, that's what I'm working with there. So uh, another example of some creative shots at the tennis. Um, again, this time using the, this is up from the catwalk and I'm just using the, um, the actual handrail of the catwalk here just to create a, almost like a, a sphere of light coming through. Um, I'm manually focusing on where he's serving just because uh, and I'm shooting with a 400. So I can't really focus in there, it's a bit blurry. But then I'm st stopping my uh, aperture down to f8 just to get a bit more of a stronger line in the rail. Because it's so close to me, if I was at 2.8, it'd just be a hazy, hazy line. So to get a bit more of a sharpness, I've gone down to f8. Uh, this is another example. This, this time it's from uh, the pool position at the tennis behind the glass. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows what the pool, pool position is, but basically it's a, it's a spot where there's not enough room for everyone to be. So they actually allocate one photographer to shoot from there and then he has to share it amongst the other agencies. So everyone gets access to the images. It, it can be a great shot if they turn your way. Um, some games you can get not much. Um, this was one of those days, but I decided to, just below this is a bit of signage. So again, getting down on my knees, trying to isolate him in the crowd. Um, and this time I thought, I sort of saw all the colour in the crowd, I thought let's try and use that. So I went for a bit of a, a zoom blur, so um, yeah, this is an eighth of a second. Um, so with my 70 to 200, I'm starting at 200 at the start of the exposure and then zooming out to a 70th just to get the effect from the crowd. Uh, yeah, that's good. So just some other examples from um, gymnastics, another favourite sport of mine to shoot. Again, other things I talked about, but again, nice clean background, so th there's nothing to distract you. Again, I was playing around with this a lot during this event, but trying to get the, the perfect exposure, so I've got the sharpness in the face, but the ribbons are actually alive with movement. Um, so this was a 25th of a second. Um, yeah, I just, I just love the, as I said, the movement in those ribbons there. And a, another example, so I think this time I'm at a quarter of a second. Uh, again, and this works for me because I've got the, uh, the torso and the face is held together, but the arms and legs are almost like wings to me um, and, and show the great movement. I've, I've kept in the bars of the, the parallel bars there just to show I guess where he's come from and where he's landing. But uh, yeah, it's got real energy for me, this image. Uh, this is, um, yeah, another example from swimming. Um, this was over in, in Adelaide and I think it was about the third or fourth day. Uh, obviously indoor venue, but they had some, um, just some small lights in the, in the roof and it had been overcast up until then and I was shooting on the pool deck and just the sun came out and I noticed these, these strips of light coming across the pool. 
um, and thought, geez, that could really work well from up in the roof. So the next day, um, myself and another photographer, Deli Carr, managed to get access to a catwalk. And luckily for us, the sun was out again. Um, and again, it was about lining up the action of when the, swimming was, the swimmers were going to rise through these, these lines on the pool. And uh, just the, I guess, the ripples um, from their movement just created these amazing patterns. Uh, yeah, this is going to be my last slide, so I'm just going to open up if anyone's got any questions, but uh, I guess as you walk away, if you take a few things from me, I, I think it's really important to put the preparation in uh, before you go to shoot. Yeah, you know, try and use light where you can you know, and really create a mood and just yeah, really think about clean backgrounds that uh, you know, the viewer can't help but just look directly at the action. So uh, well, yeah, thank you very much for your time and yeah, open up if anyone's got any questions. Yeah, sure. Would you pre-focus or do a uh, auto-focused? And how many uh, frames would you shoot in a burst? Uh, for any, any shot in particular, I, I, I'm usually auto-focused. Yep. Um, for example, that one I did up in the catwalk with the black beam because uh, we, I couldn't really focus properly, I was manually focusing, but usually auto-focus. I mean, auto-focus these days is, is so good. And it, even um, that example of the synchronised swimmer coming out of the water, I pre-focused on where I thought she was going to come out, but I was relying on my auto-focus to pick her up when she actually came out of the water. But as I said, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of pre-focusing already, so hopefully my focus point is close so it doesn't have far to go. You know, I mean, I don't really want it focused here because it's going to take a while to get there. So, yeah, but autofocus these days are pretty amazing. So, yeah. Do you yes. use, like, centre spot or whatever, or so you have a... I'm, I generally use, yeah, centre focus. Uh, I don't like to try and confuse my camera too much with having too many focus points. Um, yeah, I, I might occasionally move it across if I'm trying to put something to the side of the action, but yeah, I, I tend to stick to single centre point focus, that's what I use. Well, if, if I was doing something that was off the side, I'd move my focus point over, but I, I'd still only have one point. I wouldn't have, you know, you can get the rings and that sort of stuff, I stick to one point for me, yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, in in shooting sports photography, um, you know what your editors want, yeah. and um, usually it's an image, even sort of speed images, like we were talking about say, cars moving and things like that, yeah. where your image is sharp, and, um, and yet you get other people that are sort of just into sports photography, not really understanding what's involved or what's expected, they're saying, oh, it stands still, there's no motion with it. Yeah, yeah. So you, there's that sort of... Between what your editors want, yeah. you know, um, you know, it has to be sharp, regardless of whether there's no motion, it has to be a sharp image. Correct, yeah. Uh, but I think um, probably, especially race car photography is a bit, bit different because, A, like you said, you, you want to see movement. I know some of the race photographers won't shoot at really high ISO because it looks like the, the car's parked, for instance. So sometimes you want that bit of movement. Um, other things, like if you're shooting motorbikes, I think too, be, like for example motorbikes, because you can see the guy riding it, whereas a car you can't see the person, and you've got that angle. Yeah, but what I was getting yeah. at, editors, uh, whether it's not necessarily cars, it's probably a bad example, example, but say for instance, an athlete, athlete running, running, he has to be pin sharp, yeah. not, you don't want his arms flying around. That's if right. It's a, if it's a stop shot. shot. That's correct, yeah. yeah. And, and that's what I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to say, like, when I have the opportunity, you have that opportunity to do some creative shots, but you first want to get that stock picture. Um, I had someone ask me once about the Olympic, Olympics and if I'd get in trouble if I didn't uh, come up with, you know, a really creative shot and I look at those as, as bonuses. The time I would get in trouble, as I said, if I didn't have a clean stock picture of every athlete that they requested. So I've got to get those first. and. You know, that's, that's the key part of it. So once you get that, then you've got the opportunity to do some more creative things. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, 
On one of your earlier shots, you had the security guard in the background yeah. of the way. Yeah. Um, is there any reason with what you did why you can't just photoshop that? Uh, yeah, I should, have, I should have touched on that, but yeah, we have a thing called uh, editorial integrity. So basically the only things we can do to an image is crop, um, do the levels and if needed a little bit of sharpening. Just because we, we work in the editorial world, we can't take things out as much as we'd like to. It's got to be as you see it, so you've got to yeah, try and position yourself in the, in the, in the right spot. Um, I don't know if I touched on this before, but yeah, we work in JPEGs, so I don't wa work in RAWs. Um, one for speed, but yeah, same reason. Uh, I can't manipulate photos. Um, there's, you know, there's been stories overseas where people have manipulated things and they lose their job. It's just got to be, um, yeah, you've got to show it how it is. And the only way, I guess, you can create things is, is like darkroom techniques, so if you're over or under exposing in the camera, but it's got to be all done in the camera. Yeah, sure. Oh, hi, thank, thanks. Great presentation, thank you. Thank you. Do you do anything to do, do you have anything to do with social media and do you adjust any of what you do for social media? Uh, I'm a bit behind the eight ball with, with social media, so um, for a while my company was against Instagram and things like that, but we're now slowly getting on there. Um, I, I think most people sort of accept for Instagrams and things, people might uh, tweak them a bit more, but again, I'm trying to sort of show, I guess I'm sort of using um, social media to advertise what I do. So, so uh, thank you, Julie. My Instagram handle is yeah, Quinn Rooney 13 um, if anyone's interested. <laughs> That, but I think it's time for the presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 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 Thank you.